All right. So, principle number two: UAS components and equipment. All right. And this is one of my. Um, this is this is a great picture. One of my esteemed colleagues, uh, Dr. Chris Holmquist Johnson. He's a hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey out of Fort Collins, and he's been in the UAS program in DOI since the very beginnings. Um, more than six or seven years ago and this is one of the things he does he he floats down he monitors uh, river levels for various hydrological reasons but um, I think this is him on the Green River somewhere in Colorado and you know him and his team they float down the river um, doing various scientific measurements and then uh, capturing three-dimensional models using drones of certain key elements of the river. So when you're talking about what kind of equipment do we need to conduct a UAS mission, the point of this picture is that's an infinite list, right? There, we have to be, we have to know what the hell we're doing. We have to have some expertise in what we're doing um, before we can apply UAS to that project, right? We can't if we're if we're experts at UAS, that allows us to be part of a project, uh, but we're still going to need someone with expertise in what we're collecting data for, right? So, Chris has been a hydrologist for 20 years. Got into UAS, you know, five six years ago. So now he's able easily able to apply. UAS to the particular skill set that he's spent many, many years acquiring. So you can imagine um, you have to have, even if we're just thinking about UAS specifically, if you're on this mission, imagine you're floating on a rubber ducky down the, you know, down a river, you got to have some pretty good um, leak proof and waterproof material for the UAS carry all the carry the multiple sensors if I know Chris well um, this is probably not the only UAS he's even carrying he probably has a couple different options and we'll talk a little bit about um, what we need to think about when we're, we're carrying some equipment on a mission such as this all right so a little note on redundancy and um, this is what I'm talking about <clears throat> At the interior, this is, I always have to give credit where credit is due, and by far the worst vendor that um, we ever had on contract, and I'm not going to mention him by name, but um, this was a guy who thought he was so smart that he didn't need anyone else's input, um, even though we have a bunch of really brilliant people. At the interior, his drones wouldn't fly, and instead they tried to kill people. Um, and eventually we just had to like nix his contract because he wouldn't work with us to fix his drones. Anyway, he did leave us with one, um, one nugget of great information. And that is he really coined this term. It's something that we had, we had lived by with Interior, but he, he coined the term in a very um, succinct phrase, which I think is really good. And it's two is one and one is none, all right? And so what this means is basically anytime you're dealing with technology, you can expect something to go wrong, all right? It's, it's the same thing that happens to you is like when you don't use Google navigation, right, and you're going somewhere, you know how to mostly get there, but um, you, need, you need Google to help you you know, find the parking spot, find the building at the end of the route, right? And so you're driving in traffic and you reach over to your dashboard and you hit Google and you say, okay, navigate to my location, right? And the little, the little clock on there just spins, right? It's like, well, Google can't find a satellite connection right now, right? And you're like, oh, come on, I know it's right here. And then by the time Google finds a connection, you pass the building up and you have to circle around the block, right? That's just technology. And technology is awesome when we 
when we use it right and when it sends us to the right building um, before we have to drive a lot extra. But the truth is technology is flawed and we tend to rely on it. We tend to over rely on it. And what happens when it fails us is we're screwed. And typically when we're thinking about UAS, um, what two is, one, two is one and one is none means is that if we bring a UAS out to a mission, let's say we're going to go, we're going to capture a bunch of images, we're going to fly all day out at this site at this park. We want to capture a 3D model. We want to make a 3D model at this park of a sculpture or something like that. Well, we drive across town out to the park to... Um, collect the imagery, we get our aircraft ready to fly, and it won't arm. We can't figure it out. We try, try. The aircraft we brought with us is just not going to arm. It's not going to work for us today. If we only brought one aircraft with us, then essentially what we're doing is for myself and for all the other crew members for the entire day's labor, we've just wasted that time, wasted that money. So the idea two is one and one is, one is none means that we should really bring enough equipment that's redundant, all right, so that we just count on everything to fail. So we're going to bring more than one battery. We're going to bring more than one controller. We're going to bring more than one aircraft. We're going to bring more than one payload. Right, and if we only have one pay, if a, if it's a fixed payload, that means we need to bring two aircraft. All right, so what do I mean down here? The statement, the statement of wisdom holds for any equipment, but increases in importance with system complexity. Certainly, any electronic equipment deserves a backup, and this is especially true for all components of the UAS. Right, so we either want to have a completely redundant system or we want to have backups of the individual components in a system. The backup concept increases in importance as potential delays jeopardize mission success. All right, so if we're working in remote areas, so the farther we have to drive, so if I'm driving from Denver to Rifle and all my equipment's in Denver, I am probably going to bring three, right? I'm probably going to be bring three drones because I don't have time to drive four hours or three hours to rifle and then drive back three hours because I didn't bring something that I need. Working under tight timetables, okay? So if I have if I have one day to conduct conduct my mission. I'm traveling for a day, I'm setting up for a day, and then I only have one day to fly, then I'm breaking down for a day and traveling for a day. So I'm spending five days to conduct one a one-day mission, then that's another instance where I'm going to actually bring three drones. I'm going to bring three payloads, and I'll talk about why payloads are really the most important in a, in a minute here. Um, so if my, the tighter the timetable, the more I'm going to use equipment to, to overcome potential uh, pitfalls. And then working in areas where replacement of, of equipment will take significant amounts of time. All right, so in the case where I have to, you know, the only, the only alternative is to buy something new. Um, if I know that I'm going to have to, the only way to get this equipment is to order it, I'm going to order two or order three just to have them on standby, right? And we'll talk a little bit about, I just, just, I'm not going to talk about budget today. We'll talk about, um, we might hit on it, but I'm not going to spend a lot of detail. But these are all things to keep in mind when you're working your budget, all right? So, um you can, you know, we can make our budget up. It doesn't have to be based on reality, which is cool because uh, we can make it whatever we want. But these are, this is a very important note to consider when you're thinking about your budget. We want to build in really good redundancy. So um, it's a lot cheaper to buy two Mavic 
Mavic Pros than it is for uh, for three of us to go out to the field and sit on our hands for eight hours, right? We could have we could have bought four, right? For as much as labor costs, we could have bought four Mavic Pros than have three people do nothing for eight hours. That's the key to consider. All right, any any questions about that? Any questions about redundancy and equipment? Anyone with experience um, seeing that in the field? I'm not talking about UAS. It could be any any field of service. I mean, photographers deal with the same thing, right? Um, it's a technology-based profession. That's why you never see a professional photographer walking around with a camera, right? They always have six bags and 40 pounds of equipment around them. That's not the only reason. Okay, but UAS components. All right, so we talked about, so a little question, I'm not gonna, I don't need you guys to answer this out loud, but something that should quickly echo in your mind, what are the four UAS components of a system, right? So um, payload and accessories, the aircraft, the ground control system, and then the remote pilot crew. All right, and so the reason, and I put those in different orders all the time, right? And um, that's sort of intentional. And right now, the reason I put payload um, first is because that's where we need to start with the UAS project, all right? So we talked about defining the UAS project first, right? And we want to start our project planning with, we want to start at the end. So at the end of the project, what do we want in our hands, right? And so how do we get here? The only way to get here is to start with the payload. The main, the main purpose of the payload is to define or is to get us whatever the pro the data the product is that we've defined in step one, right? So the once we know what payload we need, then we can look at well what aircraft do we need to fly that payload. The entire purpose of um, well, why don't I just go down the order? I'll just let me zip that. Right, and then once we know our aircraft, then, you know, the choices begin to dwindle because we have a particular payload, we have an aircraft that we're going to, or a variety of aircraft that we're probably going to have to select from that will fly that payload. And then we're probably going to have just a couple choices about what ground control station is going to work for that aircraft. And then we can start figuring out all the different pieces, all the people, the players that we need um, to make the mission a success. Okay, so sensor and payload. So we talked about a few different kind of missions and by far and a large, by far, I don't even, I'm trying to make, uh, I'm trying to say a statement. I don't even know what it is, but uh, by and large, I think that's the statement I was looking for. So by and large, um, most UAS missions are are sensor based, right? And most of those sensor based missions are going to be um, image sensors. So a camera, right? Um, the simplest, the simplest UAS payload is the camera, and most of the time we're just collecting imagery to do something with that project. But it's not the only project, right? So a couple people in uh, a couple people have have showed that fire the firefighting drones video, and there are a bunch of them out there. Every every semester, at least a couple people are drawn to that, and I see a couple different videos, but. That's an idea where, yes, there's a camera on there. I'm sure the pilots are using a camera to see, like, how effective um, their firefighting material is being at putting out the fire. But the main payload there is not just a sensor. The main payload is 
there's a big hose that goes up to the drone that has an actuator and something to project that um, firefighting equip, uh, material out onto the fire. So it doesn't have to be, uh, the, the, a sensor doesn't necessarily have to be the main payload, but often the, oftentimes, almost always, we're going to have some sort of sensor on board um, the UAS. Now, a sensor can be a sense and avoid sensor. It doesn't necessarily need to be an optical sensor that gives us feedback at the GCS. Um, sensors can come in many different ways. And these are all things we can consider payload. Anything other than the aircraft body itself can be considered part of the payload. It makes the aircraft fly and function. All right, so this is, uh, but what we're talking about here is what is getting the job done, right? So the sensor and the payload, that's really what we want to target uh, for what we're talking about for this uh, element of the UAS project. Um, this is where I want you guys to spend most, the majority of your time, right? So whatever you figure out that you want to do for your UAS project, um, this is where we need to spend most of our time, figure out what payload is going to accomplish that mission. Then we can start looking at well, what are our aircraft options for using that payload. The primary purpose of the UAV is just to get our payload and sensor into where we need it, right? So that's why UAS is so popular today because it gives us the ability, it gives us lowly peasants the ability to put a camera in a really cool location, right? Where traditionally five, ten years ago, the only people that got to see that viewpoint was, you know, well, like the people in this class, you guys taking the, going through an aviation program, man pilots, people that got to, you know, to get their hands on on a yoke and sit in the cockpit and fly up in the air. Those were the only people that used to get to see what it's like um, from that vantage point. Now UAS gives us all accessibility to this vantage point and the primary purpose of that aircraft is simply to get that sensor to an advantageous location. Right? We can think about all the different things that go into the UAS but it really what if you boil down to it, all it is is a vehicle, right? It's just a vehicle that can get to really cool places. All right, so selection of an airframe depends on many key questions. Number one, what is the required payload? Number two, what are the system requirements for range, endurance, and reliability? Right, so if we're, you know, the the... The shorter the requirements for all three of those things, range, endurance, reliability, the more our options, the more options exist. If we only have to fly for a short amount of time, really close to us in a very open area, there are, um, there are thousands of aircraft we could use, right? But um, as soon as we have to extend that range past one mile, all of a sudden, the number of aircraft we can use shrinks dramatically. Um, if we need to fly beyond 30 minutes, same thing. There are really only a couple UAS that can fly more than 30 minutes. And if we're flying in really complex terrain or, um, and what I mean by complex, either complex from a navigation point of view or complex from receiving information from satellites, so if we're in an urban area with a lot of backscatter, uh, we need a very reliable system, um, very highly customizable. So that's one thing we'll see, or you will see in your UAS careers as you start using different drones. Um, you start getting into the properties and the functionality of those drones. Some offer great, um, great ability to tweak the individual um, settings in those drones, and then some some UAS, you just sort of, you, you get what you get in the box, um, and we really don't have the ability to tweak certain settings. So 
all um, this all really depends on um, what sort of reliability and functionality we need with that system. And then finally, like a real world thing, you know, what are the system costs? And honestly, this dri this is going to drive most things for most real people. You know, the nice thing about the UAS project is you guys can go in and, and you know, find the creme de la creme of all UAS components and um, build, you know, build your systems out and you just need to, you just need a budget to match it and you were really limited. But when you get into the real world, um, the reason DJI owns 80% of the world market share for UAS is, geez, you know what? It's it's these two bullets right here. Um, they're really unmatched in range, endurance, and reliability, and knock a zero off of anything else you're going to see out there for drones that can match range, endurance, and reliability. Um, and honestly, they're just you know for the, for the commercial off the shelf market. There's really nothing um, competing with DJI right now for these three things, unless you add two zeros. Honestly, um, to, to for a UAS to with the same amount of range as your commercial off-the-shelf Mavic, if you want to fly more than a mile away, I mean, you have to spend upwards above fifty thousand dollars for um, something that has a really powerful um, radio it's just it's just crazy and insane um, the US government has a big initiative right now to to bring the US the bring the United States on board sort of with what DJI has been able to produce all right and then so We've selected our payload. We've then selected our subsequent aircraft to fly that payload. Now we can start figuring out, well, you know, do we even have a ground control system option? Um, usually we do. Usually there are a couple different options out there. Um, you know, and what, what it, but we might only have one. It just kind of depends on what UAS we've selected. So the ground controlled system provides uh, the interface between the aircraft and us, the operator. All right, controls are provided for both manual and automated UAV flight execution. So the, the ground control systems are comprised of the following components, or elements, sorry. We're in subcomponent. So we have our hardware and firmware, and this is just a little reminder, right? The hardware, the um, the machine user interface, and I'll just throw up what I'm talking about because there's one sitting right here. And these are cool. These are um, these are new. This is a new system that we just got for. We're using these for the 2040 class now. So this is the the company is EXO, and it's another Chinese company, but they're based out of Salt Lake City. And this is just a ground control station where you can fold out, and then um, your smartphone fits right here. So the machine interface has these sticks, and then we have all these buttons that we can do different things with the UAS. That's your machine, human-machine interface. Then we have software. Um, so the software goes on the phone. I installed the app a couple days ago for the, the EXO Ranger app. And what that does allows me to interface with the machine a little bit, allows me to get to know when the battery is getting low, and allows me to um, give some more commands to that UAV. <clears throat> and then the final element of the GCS is us, the operator. <clears throat> Whether it's the wiggle of the stick or a few keystrokes on the computer, um, the GCS keeps the human in charge. Okay. <clears throat> 
So now we know what sensor we're going to use. We've selected a subsequent aircraft. And now we know what ground control system we're going to use because of that aircraft. Now we can start thinking about, um, well, what, what does my team look like that I'm going to need to pull off this mission? All right, so users are at the center. Humans are at the center of the UAS. Um, we must make decisions at the very broad and narrow scales to achieve mission and project success. Right, so what I mean by broad and, um, so very broad and narrow, so very broad as in what kind of, what kind of, uh, what is our overall goal and what sensor do I need to achieve that goal? Like that's, those are pretty broad decisions. And then very narrow decisions like, man, the wind is 20 gusting to 25 and the manufacturer specs say 25 miles per hour for maximum flight. Do I fly? Do I wait five minutes? Do I call the mission off because I got three people out here doing nothing and I'm wasting a bunch of time? That's what I mean. The, the user has to make every single decision, right? So there's a very, there's a big spectrum of decisions we have to make. All right, so two major areas of aeronautical study that address the decision and actions made by human UAS operators, right? And if we want to understand this a little bit more detail, again, we can go back to our previous modules on human factors. But um, so human factors, the study of how humans and machines work together. And then um, crew resource management, which is basically how do we work with other humans and equipment to be very effective at what we're doing for the UAS. All right, CRM, know thyself and the strengths and weaknesses of those around us. Amen. Um, God's everywhere. We can pray for everything, right? Even, even good crew selections on our for our UAS crew. Okay, so who do we need for the UAS crew? And and here's where you know I just again this is something I have these little things I throw out there just to generate some creative juices in your minds. Um, so. You know, just a couple topics like so flight operation and execution. This is where I really want you guys to focus your efforts. Um, so I'm not just talking about what to consider. I'm talking about what to consider for your AES 1040 UAS project, okay? So a project lead. So at the beginning, if you think about that pic picture of uh, – uh, I just – so Dr. Holmquist Johnson here, we call him Dr. Hojo. Um, I call him Chris. But when we think about Dr. Hojo, um, so Dr. Hojo has the unique experience of being a really great hy hydrologist and a really great UAS um, leader uh, or a UAS pilot. But we might, you know, if we're a UAS if we're a UAS pilot and we want to lead this project, we also might need to find someone that is an expert at the project side. Um, where we're the expert at UAS, but we need someone to make sure that we're capturing exactly um, what we need to capture with the UAS. Um, that's where supporting scientists also come in handy, you know, uh, so that we're, we're doing the right thing. Local experts, so maybe uh, we might have someone that understands the goal of the mission really well, but there might be local variations, or we might have local experts that understand airspace really well and the hazards of airspace, or someone that knows exactly where we're going to be able to launch and recover from um, that's near our subject area. So local experts are always awesome to bring 
in as early as possible to the project to help with planning um, so that we can be successful and efficient with our with our mission. Of course, we're going to need pilots. Um, two is one, one is none, right? So we want at least two pilots on any mission day. We don't want to ever um, schedule a mission day and have all of that riding on a single person's uh, thumbs, right? We, we want to have options. We want to have at least a couple pilots. And that goes for, um, as, as a remote pilot in charge, I always want to have a second pilot, either not necessarily to fly, but just as someone to be like, man, I'm at 30%. I have three minutes left. What do you think? You think I should? You think I should finish this transact, or should I just come back, play it safe? You know, just to be able to bounce that off my VO, like real quick, just to be able to make a decision like that. Um, that's going to help. That's going to help promote the chances of success for that mission. Observers, so we don't need to necessarily have people involved with the UAS as observers. It's always helpful. Um, it's always helpful to be able to like be looking at my UAS and to say, "Man, what? I just felt a weird beep. Hey, can you look at my controller? What is it telling me? Where I'm? I have my eyes on the aircraft. My visual observer knows." UAS can look at the controller and give you a little bit uh, more information. That's great, but observers don't have to be versed in UAS. It's just a good benefit. So communications. So who's coordinating the airspace? If we're if we're in controlled airspace, um, or even if we're not in controlled airspace, when I any time that we fly as part of the interior. Uh, we always have a, an air-to-ground radio so that we can, um, if a manned aircraft enters our enters our air, area of operations, I know the frequencies, right? So I know the um, frequencies to communicate with that. The likely frequencies that manned aircraft are are likely to be monitoring. So um, if an aircraft, a manned aircraft, happens to enter my airspace low. And you know, in a in a confliction uh, vector, I can, you know, I have another op I have another personnel. So maybe it's a, I have a operator, I have a visual observer, and then maybe I have a third person that just has that handheld radio, whose mission is simply to communicate with manned aircraft as they enter. Um, is anyone from Alaska on this call? Anyone from Alaska? So one thing about Alaska is everyone flies manned aircraft everywhere because Alaska is huge. So if you're flying UAS in Alaska, you like almost need to have you almost have to have an air-to-ground radio, um, and uh, you almost always have to have someone. Just their sole mission is to be on that radio to potentially talk to uh, deconfliction. So crowd control, if we're operating in a park or something like that, um, you, everyone, you know, it's not like people are mean and they want to come push you over or knock the controller out of your hand, but people have, you know, I'm sh hopefully you guys have talked about the idea of sterile cockpit and your other aviation training, and people are oblivious to the fact that if I'm just standing there like staring off into the blue sky, that's what people think you're doing. It's like, no, I'm actually making calculated decisions about how to fly my aircraft. So if you would quit talking to me, that would be awesome, right? So maybe you have another personnel whose sole job is to is to cut people off before they get up to the operator and nicely describe what you're doing. You know, like, oh, that looks so cool. Yeah, we're actually conducting... Um, we're collecting scientific data. We're monitoring bird species that are tied to this vegetation. Blah blah blah. You, and some people. And Chris, uh, Dr. Hojo is actually the person that turned me on to this. Is he often one of his flying sites is in a residential area, and he printed up a bunch of flyers, and he had, he brings a little intern out to him, 
what I mean by flyer is the little piece of paper that describes what he's doing. And he has a person, so when he's flying his missions in this residential area, he has a person that just as people walk up, he hands them a flyer. And the flyer describes what the mission is and what, what they're doing out there. But the idea is that crowd control can be a really big thing. And often we have to commit uh, a particular person. And if your UAS project for this class deals with populated areas, you better, you better have someone designated as crowd control as part of your UAS group. Data and payload recovery, and if, you know, I can't overemphasize this, I'm a data person, that's why I got into UAS. This is the most underestimated element of every UAS project. People think that, oh, I, I need a, you know, people think I need a UAS pilot to be, to conduct UAS missions. All right, you do need a UAS pilot, but I'll tell you what, you'll spend a, you know, you can spend an hour or two collecting data and then spend two weeks uh, managing, processing that data to get a decent product out of it. Um, data, data collection and processing is a huge, huge task. And if your UAS mission that you're doing for this class is focused on a data product, make sure you are including um, not only not only people to sit down at the computer and process the data, um, but someone that is like when you land, goes and physically takes that the the card out of the aircraft, out of the payload, swaps it out with another card, and collects that data, makes a redundant copy. And we'll talk about data are gold. Um, on Wednesday, and what I mean by that, um, and you need another person just to make sure that the data are collected. All right, and then subject matter experts. So anyone knows more that knows more about what you're collecting than you do, All right? This is sort of like project leads and supporting scientists. The same concept there. Right, so that's the basic operations. We also need um, administration and management. You know, we need people that are good at maintenance. We need people that are good at analysis and planning. So organizing personnel, organizing training. Um, what I'm talking about here is like bigger scope analysis and training. How do we hire the right kind of people so that we can conduct a broad range of missions. Um, that sort of stuff is sort of bigger than the um, than just the product side. Ed product, so having someone that's a marketer that can talk to clients and generate business, um, and then deliver, you know, deliver that product with a bow, and sort of the the, the kind of things that. If you're involved with col collecting the data and producing the data, you know, maybe you're not so good at thinking about what is the client going to see when they stick that USB drive in their computer, right? So these are all just things to consider, you know, when we're trying to organize a comprehensive UAS crew. So other equipment and so let me just say, you know, the list of equipment is infinite, and you can go back and look at, um, I did talk about uh, payload and, assessor and accessories as part of the UAS components. So you can go back and look at that module um, if you want to get an idea about other equipment that's in there, really just thinking about the cockpit. Um, Thinking about, you know, fuel, I, you know, like I said, when we talked about UAS components, you know, fuel is the, is the lifeblood 